Hello class. So today's lesson is on kinetic and potential energy. We're going to go over basically the difference between the two, how they convert from one to the other, and then a little bit of math to figure out exactly how much kinetic or potential an object will have. So let's get to it. So the first thing you need to know is basically what is potential and what is kinetic. So potential is, sen is essentially energy that is stored energy. So an object might not be doing anything in particular, but it has the ability to do energy, so it's stored inside in some way. And then kinetic is some sort of energy of motion. And the reality is there's a whole lot of different types of potential and a whole lot of different types of kinetic. But today we're just focusing on the two most common types, which are gravitational potential and mechanical kinetic. So throughout this presentation, you're going to hear me just say potential and kinetic. But what I'm referring to is gravitational potential and mechanical kinetic. At some point very soon, we'll get into the other types of potential and kinetic. So for now, let's take a look at our little skateboarder here. And he'll do a great job of showing the different types of potential and kinetic. So what's happening here is he's going up and down and up and down. And so one of the things to realize right off the bat is that energy changes from one form to the other. So this is constantly changing from kinetic to potential and kinetic to potential, but no energy is being lost or gained. That's the conservation of energy. So you can't just create or lose energy, it just gets changed from one form to the other. And that's what this is doing over and over again, it's changing from kinetic to potential. So let's slow them down a little bit. So the green represents the kinetic and the blue represents potential. So at the very, very tippy top up here, at his highest point, he has the most potential. He's actually not moving at all for a split second, but he has all the potential to start going down the ramp. And then as he starts going down the ramp, you'll see that he starts gaining speed which is essentially kinetic energy, he starts gaining motion. But now since he's closer to the ground, he has less potential. And he continues farther and farther, and then when he gets to the very bottom of the ramp, he now has full kinetic energy. So what that means is that all the energy up here has changed to motion. Uh, here at the bottom of the ramp is where he's at max speed. Sometimes students think that somehow in the middle is the max speed, but here is because he keeps getting faster and faster and faster. When he gets here, he has the most speed. And then as he continues, he starts going up the ramp and starts getting slower and slower and slower and slower. So what that means is since he gets slower, the kinetic energy is less, and he gets more and more potential because he gets higher and higher and then he stops for a split second, and then the process continues over and over again. Potential turning to kinetic and back and forth. So let's take a look here to make sure that you know what we're talking about. Then we'll get into the math part, so I call us test your knowledge. So if I asked you this question here, if this is a ball rolling down the ramp and over again, and I said to you, what letter has the most potential energy? I'll give you a second to think about it. And the answer here is letter A. At its highest point, it had the most potential energy. If I asked you when it had the most kinetic energy, it would be letter D. Down here at the bottom, it would be the fastest at the most kinetic energy. And if I said the least potential, that would also be letter D. Okay, it's as fast as it's going to go. It has no more potential to go any faster. And then least kinetic would be up here once again at letter A. It'd be its slowest point there. And then a question like this, just a little bit more kinetic than A. Now you might want to say B in this case, and you'd be kind of right, but the best answer here is G, because here it would get faster and faster, and then faster and faster and faster, and then slow down. So really right here it's its slowest, and here it's just a little bit faster than A, because it's a little bit lower. So I wanted to put that on there. Okay, that concludes the first part. Now let's get into the math. So for the math part, there is a way to figure out the exact kinetic and potential energy an object has. The first thing you need to know is the unit we use is called joules. So if I asked you how much kinetic or potential energy something has, you'd say 10 joules, 5 joules, and so on and so forth. So let's go back to our skateboarder for a second. And he's going to help us figure out the factors. We're going to talk about potential energy first. So there's three things that affect potential energy. So again, I want you to think of potential energy like if you're standing underneath an object, the potential energy it has, basically how hard it's going to hit you. So if you're standing underneath like a really small object, like a little pebble, compared to like a bowling ball, you'd probably be more scared of a bowling ball because it has more potential energy. So that kind of answers the first question of, well, why would a bowling ball have more than a um, pebble? And the reason is that the golf, I'm sorry, the bowling ball would have more mass. 
So if we choose something like a bug here, you'll see that this little dot here represents the potential energy that it has. So because it has a whole lot less mass, now if you drop it, it's not going to drop with a whole lot of energy. Whereas something like, I guess he was the highest mass, but if we change it to something in the middle, you see the circle keeps getting smaller and smaller because of the mass. So mass is one of the factors. Another factor, though, let's go with our little dog here, is if you were holding, I guess, a dog over your head and you're about to drop it, it might hurt you. Then if you held it even higher, you'd probably be more scared. If the dog was way up here, you'd be even more scared of it hitting you. And all the way up here, you know that it would hit you with a whole lot of energy. So if you see what's happening to the circle, is the higher I go, the bigger the circle gets. So if I release it over here, it has a little bit of potential energy. All the way up here, a whole lot of potential energy. So one of the factors besides mass is the height. The height from the, you know, the distance it's going to fall to whatever you're dropping it on. So maybe it's a little easier with this skater. Let's see. It's a big circle and all the way down a small circle. So you see the circle changes. That represents how much energy. Okay, and then there's one more factor which doesn't really affect us too often. The main things are the mass and the height. But the reason that objects have potential energy is because when you drop them, they fall. And you know that things fall because of gravity. So gravity here on Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. But let's just say that we held this guy and we went to the moon or Jupiter. There we go. Okay, we go to Jupiter, it's a much bigger circle. We go to the moon, a much smaller circle. So the third factor is the polar gravity. So places that have low gravity, it'll fall with less energy. So if you're on the moon, you would fall slower and therefore have less potential energy because you would accelerate less. Whereas on Jupiter, if you were held up here, you'd start falling faster and faster with a much higher rate of acceleration and therefore gain energy much quicker. So those are the three factors, the mass, the pull of gravity, and the height. So what's really nice is that there's a really simple formula to figure out how much potential energy something has. And what it is, is it's mass times gravity times height. So by gravity, I mean the acceleration of gravity. So if I go back to this one, even though it's 9.8 meters per second squared, what we're going to do in our class is just make it 10 meters per second squared so it's easy math because the numbers will be still pretty darn close. So if you wanted to find the gravitational energy of something like this, so you said it's a three kilogram pot, it's two meters high here on Earth, how much potential energy does it have? All you would do is three times two times 10 you would get 60 joules. 3 times 2 times 10. Don't forget the 10, even though it's not in the problem. If we're here on Earth, we're always going to multiply it by 10. That's it, gravitational potential energy. The math is pretty darn easy, I would say. However, here's where things get a little bit tricky. Sometimes the problem will already be, in theory, easier for you, because what's happening is, even though the formula is mass times gravity times height, what mass times gravity is, it's, it's a force, I'm sorry, it's an acceleration times a mass, and you remember back when we learned about forces, that when you have a mass times acceleration, it's a force. So, sometimes you'll get a problem like this. What is the potential energy of a 10 Newton book that is 2.5 meters high? So if you see something like this, where it's in Newtons, it means they've already multiplied mass times gravity for you already. So instead of mass times gravity times height, it's just Newtons times height. So this part's confusing for you. Definitely watch this part again, because this always trips people up. So it's really an easier math problem. So instead of mass times gravity times height, it's just Newtons times height. So it's 10 times 2.5, and then you get 25 joules. So it actually cuts out a step. So definitely watch that again if that was confusing to you. All right, and now kinetic energy. So let's say we go back to our skateboarder. <clears throat> let's go back to Earth, and we drop him. And I want to know right there how much kinetic energy does he have right there? If I want to know that, I need to know two things. I need to know the mass of him, and I need to know how fast he is going. That's it, the mass and how fast he's going. And then the formula looks a little bit crazier. So the formula is one half times mass times velocity squared. So if you ever need to know the kinetic energy, you just need the mass and how fast they're going, and this is your formula, one half mv squared. Velocity has to be in meters per second, and the mass has to be in kilograms. 
So here's a sample problem. What's the kinetic energy of a three kilogram ball? It's rolling at two meters per second. So it's just one half times mass times the velocity squared. So one half times three times two squared. So one half times three times four, or one half times 12, and you end up with six joules. There's another video I'm gonna have on here that does a good job with the math and does some more sample problems if you need it. So one thing that I'm gonna end on just to make sure you get this is I'm going, all right, sorry if I'm repeating myself, but my program just stopped recording. So anyway, I'm gonna go back to this guy for a second. If I hold him right here and I ask you how much kinetic energy will he have when he gets to the bottom, you could somehow figure out his velocity at the bottom and then do one half mv squared, but that's really kind of hard to do. So don't forget that potential turns into kinetic. So if you drop this, Oops, that was poorly done. Let's see if I can stop from right before. Okay, that was pretty close. Is that all the potential turns to kinetic. So if you just figure out how much potential he has up here, it'll be the exact same as the kinetic over here. So you just do mass times gravity times height, and that'll tell you when he gets to this spot, that'll be his kinetic energy. So you can go back and forth. So don't forget that aspect. Um, and then another thing that people forget about is like if you're, say, you're throwing a ball up in the air, if you were to throw something up in the air, I guess we actually have a ball, so let's use it. If I were to throw a ball up in the air, as soon as I throw it into the air, that's when it's its fastest. And then it starts gaining more and more and more and more and more potential and it slows down and it stops up here and then it comes back down. And when you throw a ball, the instant it leaves your hand and the instant it comes back to your hand, it'll have the exact same amount of kinetic energy. It'll be its maximum kinetic energy. I know that seems a little bit confusing, so definitely ask me if that's confusing to you. Anyway, so now you know how to distinguish potential and kinetic, and you know some math problems. As always, I encourage you to check out this animation on your own, or check out some of the links that I gave you to clarify any areas that I explained to you that are a little bit confusing. And as always, if you ever need me, make sure you come see me for help. I would be glad to help you understand this concept. Thank you very much.